take over here and um, welcome, guys. Thank you, Mike. Yeah, thank you. Hey, guys. How you doing? Good. Yeah. So, how, oh, is this up? Yeah. So, how about the fact that Mike is back in Dream Theater? Huh? Yeah. I think that's a question on everybody's mind. You know, can we get a little bit of the backstory of how that came to happen, how you got back to the band? Well, it's been 13 years now, and uh, it's crazy how time flies, but the last couple of years, I guess during the pandemic, yeah, I, I reconnected with John Pedrucci once we were in lockdown, and I, all of my 87 bands couldn't tour, and Dream Theater couldn't tour. Um, John, John Patricia was doing a solo album and he asked me to play on it and and then from there we decided we wanted to do another LTV album which is with Jordan Brutus and then uh, shortly after that John asked me to go on tour with him so it just seems like you know that the, we've been kind of reconnecting through the last few years and you know we have such a long history almost 40 years now together and our families grew up together our wives our wives played in a band together and our kids grew up together so um, honestly, it, it just felt like it was, you know, the right thing in the right time. Yeah, I saw that your daughter posted something where she was like, I can't wait for this part of it with all the kids together on yeah. tour. So I mean, awesome. they literally grew up all together, you know, shit, you know, with, it, with, you know, in the top bunks across from each other on the bus and, you know, uh, my daughter and John's daughter have lived together in New York for the last four or five years. So, yeah, I mean, there's, a, there's so much family history beyond just the music that, uh, you know, it just felt like the time was right to, 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 to do it. Right, well, we're all excited for sure. I know everyone has a lot of questions, so uh, let's just open it right up. If, if someone has a question, just raise your hand. We got one right in the back there. Yell so we can hear you. How's it going, Mike? Hey. Uh, what are the odds of the first album that you make with Dream Theater again after the long hiatus being Metropolis Part 3? Right. <laughs> um, we haven't talked about it yet, but uh, I mean that would be the obvious thing. The obvious thing, but maybe because it's the obvious thing, we wouldn't do it. Yeah. Uh, but you never know. You yeah. never know. I mean, the cons of that would be literally all of us just implode and die, and you have no more fans left because you broke our minds. <laughs> I mean, it definitely would be would be fun to do, but I yeah. think uh, I don't know. We just we're going to start from scratch and reconnect and just go into the studio and live together and after all, you know, we're, we're in a, a different phase of our lives, you know, when, when I left the band 13 years ago, we were all in our 40s, now we're all in our 50s and 60s, and, you know, it's just, it's going to be interesting to see how, you know, we kind of exist now in this new world, you know, so yeah, I'm just looking forward to being with you guys, making music together again. Good to have you back. Thank you, man. Just feel free to raise your hands as soon as uh, as soon as you have a question, if you have anything. Uh, yeah, we got one over here. And, and just sorry, real quick, David wants me to repeat the question for those in the back. Will uh, Will your time in the band affect how many Mangini songs you guys play? It's too soon to tell. I mean, um, when I left the band 13 years ago, I was the one writing the set list and things like that. So. Uh, we haven't even discussed what the new dynamic is going to be, so um, I'm open to it, of course, you know, so I, I surely would, would do it if that's what they want to do, but it's definitely going to be a different dynamic. I think when I left all those years ago, um, I was running a lot of stuff, and I think now they've gotten so, so used to working more as a collective band that I think it's a very different dynamic now that I'm going to have to find my place in. And without stepping on anybody's toes, I have to respect that they've been doing it all this time without me. So, whatever they want to do, I'm, I'm you know, I'm up for it. So, but there, that being said, there is so much music of ours to to come back and play that you know, I personally, I I look forward to revisiting all that stuff. But if they want to do the newer stuff as well, whatever they want is fine with me. Uh, I'll, I'll ask a question real quick. You know, we've seen you in a, in a number of bands over the last 13 years or so, the last 10 years, whatever it was, the last decade. Uh, is that going to continue? Will you continue to do Winery Dogs and, you know, some of the projects you've done? Well, currently, I'm, I mean, before the Dream Theater 
thing happened. I think I was up to like seven bands or something currently, or eight or something like that. So obviously I won't be able to do all of them. And right now the focus is going back to Dream Theater and, and focusing on that. So I, I have a feeling some some of the bands will survive and some won't. But I think the winery dogs, it's very likely that the winery dogs will continue. And uh, we, we still are continuing. I leave for Japan uh, on Tuesday for for uh, you know a few weeks over there with the winery dogs. So and we ju we just filmed a live uh, a live Blu-ray. Um, last week in, at the last show in Europe, so that'll be coming out. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's, there's still other things on, on my schedule. I still have a, a, a show of Metal Allegiance in January in Anaheim, and I still have uh, uh, some shows with Flying Colors, which is my band with Steve Morris and Dave LaRue, and we're still we're playing on Cruise to the Edge in March. So I still do have these other obligations, and you know, these other things that I still have on the calendar with all these other bands. But, I think once all of those obligations clear, you know, I'm going to focus on Dream Theater at least for a while. Right. And, uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, someone who's seen you normally multiple times, these two or six images in words, is there a chance that the set list for the end become dynamic and not static? So if I go see Dream Theater three or four times on a tour, I will not be saying 17 songs. Right. right. Uh, it's okay. I, uh, once again, I gotta find my feet and my place in the new dynamic. But the set lists were a big, big passion of mine all those years in the band, and I was the one that wrote a different set list for every show. And I mean, uh, personally, I love that, and I know the fans love it. It makes every show different from each other and exciting and interesting. Uh, but once again, I, I can't come in and just kind of force my way into the, the, the existing dynamic that they're used to. Hopefully we'll meet in the middle somewhere. You know, uh, there's probably going to be a lot of things that I won't control anymore, but then there's hopefully a lot of things that maybe they want me to take control over. And if I had a, a, a priority list of the things I'd like to take back and be able to oversee, doing the set list would surely be at the top of my list. That's definitely one of my strongest passions and I would love to see rotating set list, but once again, it all has to be comfortable for everybody. Uh, so, you know, just going back to your beginning a little bit, I know your, your father was a radio DJ, right? Yeah. So, would you say, is it fair to say that that is a, kind of the start of your passion for music? Absolutely. My dad was my biggest influence, and he wasn't even a musician, he was just a music fan. And I was born uh, in April of 67, um, right? The, I was born the day that the Beatles completed Sgt. Pepper. And, um, you know, literally six weeks later when it came out, I was already surrounded by it. So I grew up listening to the Beatles and the Who and Zeppelin and all that stuff. My dad turned me on to all that when I was a baby and when I was a kid. And then he became a radio disc jockey in the early 70s. And I would do his radio show with him. So being surrounded by constant music and different bands and different artists surely played a huge, huge role in my love for music and becoming a musician myself. Did you get to meet any of your idols as a kid? Did he, you know, did he do interviews and stuff like that? It was a lot different then than it is now. Now, you you know, everybody can meet everybody, especially with like VIP packages and things like that. But back in the 70s, you know, it was, you know, I would have done anything to meet Kiss, you know, you know, 1977 or whatever, you know, but it, it was just not a reality. But my dad being in radio, he had some, some years like that. Like he, you know, I, I think at the time, in the early 70s, he, he knew Jackson Brown, Linda Ronstadt, the Eagles, and he, that was part of that scene in the early 70s. So, uh, you know, I think, he, he took me to see George Harrison in 74, which was one of my first shows, and McCarthy and Wings in 76. So, you know, he just really was introduced me to the whole world of rock and music and concerts and things like that. Right. And feel free to just raise hands if, if, if any questions come up. Uh, you know, nowadays, uh, we were talking about your kids a little bit earlier. Your son, Max, is really making a name for himself in the world, though, as a drummer. 
He's, uh, he's playing with one of his favorite bands now, right? I mean, he must be so proud of him. How's that been to watch? I couldn't be prouder. He's, um, he's 24 years old, and he won uh, Modern Drummer's Best Up and Coming Drummer Award a couple years ago, which was, he won it in 2019, which was 25 years after I won that same category. 25 years ago. Yeah, it's incredible. Yeah. Yeah, he plays drums now for the band Code Orange, who's, like I was telling you earlier, is literally one of his, his three favorite bands are Slipknot, Korn, and Code Orange. He ended up joining Code Orange, and the first tour he did with them was with Slipknot, and then the next tour he did with them was with Korn. So, I mean, he's, he's living his dreams, which is amazing. I couldn't be proud of him. Yeah, we got some questions here. This might be a loaded question, but you have, like, maybe, like, some highlights or not some of your favorite, like, pre-show rituals. Highlights or pre-show rituals? There's no highlights because the 22 hours that you're waiting to go on stage are the most boring 22 hours of the day. So there's not many highlights. It's, it's literally just sitting in a dressing room looking at your phone, you know? Um, you know, and then you start to warm up as you get closer to show time. But yeah, it's not, you know, everybody, it's, it's such a meme. Everybody's seen the meme where you know, what you think is going on backstage, big parties and everybody's going crazy, and there's strippers and everything, but what's really going on is everybody's literally sitting in the dressing room looking at their phone and just waiting to rock. But yeah, I, as far as my routines, I, um, I like to warm up and stretch a little bit, you know, just, you don't want to go on stage cold, you want to have the blood flowing and have the muscles warmed up a bit. And um, I used to always get massaged before all the shows because I, I was having constant back and back and neck problems and arm issues and stuff like that. So I try to get that done whenever I can. And, uh, but yeah, it's a matter of uh, just, you know, sitting around and waiting to rock. You know, that's pretty much what you do on tour. Yeah, got a question back there? Yeah, who's your favorite drummer? Favorite drummer? I, I, I mean, I can't pick one but, because they're all so important to me, but the list of the general list is, I mean, the big four for me, uh, well, the first were the, were the big three, which was Ringo, Keith Moon, and John Bonham. I mean, those are the three guys I grew up with when I was a kid. The Who, Zeppelin, and the Beatles. Then I discovered Rush, and Neil Peart became, you know, part of the big four. And uh, once I discovered Neil and Rush, I discovered more progressive music, and that's when I started listening to Bill Bruford and Phil Collins and Simon Phillips and Terry Bozio. So those were all my heroes when I was a kid. And then as music evolved, you know, even even once I started at my own career, I was still constantly inspired with what, whatever was going on around me. So even when we were starting Dream Theater in the 80s, I was listening to, you know, uh, Anthrax and Metallica and Slayer and all, you know, all those kind of double bass drummers, which played a big part in me learning how to play the metal stuff and the double bass stuff. And, uh, I mean, even now, I mean, I'm, I'm blown away and constantly inspired by these, the, the, the level of drumming, especially online, you look at social media, you know, uh, Instagram, YouTube, these, you know, I'll, I'll see an eight-year-old girl from, you know, Korea playing my drum punch at Dream Theater, like with one hand, you know? <laughs> So the bar just keeps rising and rising and rising, and it constantly inspires me, kicks me in the butt, and makes me want to keep working at it, you know? Got one over here? Yeah, anyway. um, I'm curious about that final conversation where you guys kind of put into paper, and like, I guess it was just a few weeks ago, and you guys said, okay, I'm gonna, let's do this, but Maybe this is what I wanted, this is what I wanted. Was there any negotiation? How did that conversation go? Dream theater negotiation. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, it really wasn't, it's weird because I've dreamt about this for, for the past decade. Um, you know, I don't mean I've dreamt about it like it was my fantasy or my goal, but I mean I literally have had dreams about it, you know, while sleeping and waking up like, wow, you know, what, wow, what would it be like if that ever happened and I've ever went back to the band? And now that it actually happened, it happened, it seems like it happened quickly, but it really, like I said earlier, it's been evolving and kind of the relationships have been kind of uh, being rekindled for years. I think, you know, me and James LeBrie were the last ones to 
reconnect, because he and I hadn't spoken for a long, long time. But in answer to your question, I mean, we, we didn't even talk business. You know, John Petrucci called me, and you know, I don't want to divulge too much uh, of, of the conversation, but basically we started talking about it, and it was like a hypothetical thing, like, would you be interested if, you know, whatever. And, uh, but we didn't really talk business, we didn't talk about anything other than the dynamic, you know. We, we didn't talk business or money or any you know, concrete plans. It was more just kind of like, hey, you know, this is where I'm at this age and this point in my life, and this is where they're at, and would it be compatible? And, you know, uh, if anything, he maybe expressed some concerns about, you know, how we would fit together at this point in our lives and career. And, and we realized that we were totally, totally on the same page, and, and it just felt like totally the right, the right time. Yeah. Yep. Anything else going to happen with Sons of Apollo? Anything going to happen with Sons of Apollo? There's no plans for now. I mean, I, I've seen Bumblefoot and Jeff Scott Soto both coming out in the press saying, well, because I went back to Dream Theater, it's over. But the reality is, we were kind of on the, on the shelf for a while anyway. Like we, Really, the, the pandemic kind of shut that thing down, at least for the time being, because we, we, we came out of the gates in 2020, like full throttle, we just put out a new album. We had a, a whole year-long tour booked for the entire year, and within the first month or so of being on the road, the pandemic shut us down. And so, you know, it was the best laid plans for that band. You know, we had a whole album that we were ready to tour off of and support, and once we got shut down and put into lockdown, we kind of got put on the shelf for a few years. And then we had some makeup tours we had to do, but Billy wasn't able to do them with us. So, you know, as much as Ron and Jeff may pinpoint it on me in Dream Theater, I think, you know, we were already kind of in a holding pattern for the time being anyway. So there's no plans as of now. But I never said never. Yes, Scott. Yeah, firstly, thanks for all the great music, man. Thanks for being here. Thank you. So the question is, you guys did some official bootlegs a while back when you were in the band. That was Iron Maiden, Number of the Beast, and Master mm. Puppets. I always wondered, I mean, I love those albums. They're iconic 80s metal, but they're not super prog, or they're not. What was the mindset of saying, like, yeah, let's do official bootlegs. Let's do the whole album. It's pretty unique. I'll yeah. tell you, the, the main thing for me then was to do things that were outside of the obvious comfort zone for Dream Theater. See, over the last 13 years after I left the band, then I went and was able to do all of those things and show my love for everything from the Beatles to Pantera and everything in between. Uh, but back then, when I was still in Dream Theater full-time, I didn't have any of those kind of outlets. So I started putting together these things, like I did these tribute bands with Paul Gilbert, did a Beatles tribute, a Moon tribute, a Zeppelin tribute. And then I had this idea with Dream Theater, let's like cover full classic albums. And we did Maiden and Metallica, and we did Dark Side of the Moon, and we did uh, Deep Purple's Made in Japan. So the idea back then was to do something that was outside of the typical prog comfort zone for Dream Theater. You know? And then since then, I've done so much of that. But at the time, that was kind of an outlet to try to do some different things than the typical you know, 20 minute songs with a million time signatures, you know? Because I was this Beatles fanatic, I don't want to say trapped in a prog band, but you know, actively working in a prog band, and I didn't have an outlet for my love for all these other styles. So some of those fun shows and set lists and stuff kept it interesting. Yeah, we, we love them, so thanks for doing it. That was great. Yep, yeah, over here. <laughs> Are you talking about eating my ass and balls? <laughs> <laughs> I'm older and wiser now. I, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I think if I want to keep everybody happy, I'll, I'll keep my mouth shut. I think I am. That's the thing, honestly, you know, not to make a joke out of it, but, you know, the first 25 years with Dream Theater, I was from the age of 18 to 42 or whatever. And now we're all in a different phase and different point in our lives, you know. So it's gonna be interesting to be, you know, this age doing doing it with those guys. You know, I, 
I, I used to walk around saying, eat my ass and balls, or play shows with my underwear on my head. And I don't know, I think that was just the way I was back in my 20s and 30s when I was drunk and stupid. Now I'm just old and stupid. <laughs> <laughs> well, I am playing with Humphreys McGee, which are kind of like fish, yeah, so I'm doing a gig with them for the years, which will be fun. I, I would like to ask, what, what are your thoughts on, like, Nicky Hart, I mean, as far as his uh, drum compositions? What are my thoughts on Nicky Hart? Hart yeah. I'm not the biggest deadhead, to be honest. I, yeah, I mean, my, my jam band uh, knowledge is fish. I mean, fish was where I got the idea for Dream Theater to cover full albums, because they had done the White Album, and they had done, I think, uh, Quadrophenia, I think, and they did uh, a whole bunch of different ones, and that's where I got the idea for Dream Theater to, to cover classic albums in their entire thing. But yeah, playing with Humphreys McGee next month is going to be a, a cool experience. Yep. <clears throat> other than your warm-ups uh, before you play, do you have any other kind of exercises you do when you're not playing? Uh, like I said before, I, I try to get massage regularly if I can. And, and but no, my warm-up my warm routine is not anything specific. So you don't do like any power jogging or anything? No. <laughs> uh, although as I get older, I probably should start to do more and more of, like, of that kind of stuff. Because I you know, start, start to feel, you know, you come off stage and, you know, the older you get, the more you really start to feel it. And I'm yeah. 56 now. And, uh, so yeah, as I get older, I think that kind of stuff is more and more important for sure. You know, I'm always curious about uh, this with someone like you who has the job that you do. When uh, Dream Theater first started to make it big, or you know, after Dream Theater had made it big, and, and you're a father at this point and everything, um, what were the interactions like with other parents in your community, you know, at soccer games and stuff? How, how was that? <laughs> well, I live in a very normal suburban, um, neighborhood in, in Pennsylvania. I, I grew up in New York, uh, but about 20 years ago, I wanted to raise my kids in a more suburban area, so we moved to Pennsylvania. And yeah, I, mean, I would uh, take my kids, you know, go to my daughter's, you know, dance recitals or my son's, you know, band things. And yeah, I, I guess every, every town's got a, a local rock star, you know? <laughs> Somehow mine missed it. I don't know where it was. Yeah, 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 yeah. I don't know, but um, like I said earlier, me, you know, me and all the guys in Dream Theater, we all, we all had kids and families at the same time, so all of our kids grew up together on the road, uh, you know, hanging out backstage, looking for catering, and, um, you know, running from bus to bus. So my kids kind of grew up in that environment. So now that my son is, a, is in a touring band, he's, you know, he's He's done it his whole life, but it's you know as far as my neighborhood, and I've always had very very cool supportive neighbors and all the people that are the other parents and school and stuff like that. They've always been kind of intrigued by you know the lifestyle that we live. How could you not be? Yeah. Uh, do we got any more questions out here? Yep. Last one. Be creepy. I won't ask you the town, but what county in Pennsylvania? Because I live in York County. Oh my God. Okay. Yeah. No, yeah. Yeah, a little south of uh, Bethlehem and Allentown. Yeah. All right, well, I guess uh, I guess we're good then, uh, as far as the Q&A goes. Let's take a round of applause for Mike. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, I think we can go back to the rooms, right? And we have the schedule. Yeah, so Sean, Sam, Ben, Jackson 5, you guys can go in the big room and get started here at first. Everybody else? You have a little bit of rehearsal time before you come in with Mike. Your tour manager will come in and get you from the rehearsal rooms. And then the, the band on deck can go watch the band before you uh, in the room uh, jam. Right? So, uh, 